Welcome back, perfect peeps, to Perfect.dev. Today on the podcast, I have Justin Duke. What's up, Justin? Hey there. Thanks for having me, Alex. Absolutely. So the reason I brought Justin on is to talk all about button down and producing newsletters with button down, which is amazing. I didn't even know you were a thing until like a month ago. So it's <laughs> awesome. A um, little bit of background on Justin. Justin works at Stripe during the day and runs Button Down and Spoonbill um, in his free time. He also has a very nice corgi puppy, which uh, if you look hard enough, you can find on Instagram pretty easily. There's, <laughs> there's a link out there now. Um, also, a uh, mentor and mentors aspiring technologists in partnership with Unloop. So you'll have to tell me a little bit more, bit more about that. But uh, also, uh, with what precious time remains, he is generally either playing video games, watching Miami sports, I'm sorry about that one, or <laughs> writing for, I always mess this up, is it arcana.computer? You got it exactly right. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, that that's like this big bio of lead-in. Um, so tell me, like, do you want to talk a minute about like how Button Down became a thing and why you created it? I'd love to. Um, I, I like to think of Button Down's origin story, so to speak, is like a classic example of what not to do, um, which is I had been using a, a tool very similar to Button Down for a long time. I, I ran my own kind of like personal private newsletter. It was just like a couple hundred subscribers, not a big deal. I was using this tool called Tiny Letter, um, which had been around, I think, since I want to say like 2007, 2008. And just like was was sort of janky in the way a lot of uh, software that hasn't been touched in five years is janky of like, sure. oh, page load times are, are really slow. And like this thing just silently breaks and I didn't realize it. And I have to like do this really elaborate process of going from markdown to HTML to email HTML just to send out an email. And I had the, the worst thing I think a software developer can ever say to themselves, which is, oh, I bet I could build a better version of this in a weekend. <laughs> um, and I was like, how complicated can it be? It's like a bunch of CRUD, create, read, update, delete stuff. Um, I need to hook up to email service provider. That's kind of it. Like, I'm not going to launch this as a SaaS app. I'm just going to have it be something that I run on my laptop. Um, and so I had a free weekend back in like 2016. And um, I spent, you know, a dozen or so hours hacking on it and realized like, oh, this is way more complicated and way more involved than I expected it to be. But also, oh, this is really fun. Like I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I think there's a particular passion and excitement that comes from building something where you know you're gonna be the first user of it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so instead of it taking a weekend, it took around like a month and a half um, but it slowly grew from this thing that I just wanted to be like a self-hosted app that I could open source to a thing where I was showing friends like screenshots and demos. And they're like, oh, I would use this. Like I'm looking for a better tool to do this thing. Um, and so I ended up like building out a user model and publishing it through Heroku and like making sure that it could actually scale beyond just like my meager subscriber base. And it's been, you know, uh, a passion project ever since. It's really grown organically as to your point, newsletters have kind of exploded in, in size and fur over the past 18 months. But it's always just been this thing that I wanted to use it. And even now, even with uh, so many other folks using it, like that's kind of been my guiding principle of what is the tool that I would want to use? What do I want to see existing right. in the world? And how do I bring that about? So the the tiny letter part of that, um, was that an application that you were having to run on your own or that was a SaaS product as well? It was a SaaS product and it was okay. completely free, but it had some limitations. It was purchased, I think. I think it was originally ran as a startup and it was purchased by MailChimp as sort of a like down market okay. uh, complement to a lot of their very upstream, very like e-commerce focused offerings. So I know um, like even on the button down kind of main site before you get signed up and everything, there's kind of at the very bottom of the footer, there's there's comparisons and, and there's things like tiny letter. And the one that stuck out for me was like convert kit because I, I hear that mm -hmm. all the time. Um, did you ever think like, I'm gonna become a player that kind of goes against all of all of these other newsletter products out there, or you're like your mind's just become blown like how how big this thing's grown so far. I, I feel like the the suave answer is to say the former, right? And be yeah. like, oh, I had all of these grand aspirations and I I knew that this was going to become a wild success. And that's just not true. Like I 
built this thing thinking, hey, there are probably a couple of folks who have a similar use case for me, a similar use case as, as I do. And I bet they would really like to use this. And maybe some folks will even want to pay for it. But I never thought of it as like a, uh, a market, market entrant, so to speak, of like, sure. this is going to be a thing that's in the competitive landscape. Um, but one of the things that I did have a certain level of conviction about is like, there are a lot of really, really good email and newsletter tools. Like ConvertKit is one of them. It's, it's a really great tool for yeah. a specific use case, which is like building out drip sequences and really complex automations. Um, but I was coming from a place of, I didn't want all that. I didn't need all of that. I just wanted a very minimalist sort of feature set of, I want to send out emails every weekend and I want to be able to like keep track of my subscribers and have nice archives, but that's sort of it. I don't need, you know, complex interfaces. I don't need really sophisticated automation. I just want the bare necessities and I want it to work well. Sure. I, I think that that makes for a, a really good, like if I look at Google and everything else that grew out of just like the simplicity of it, right? You want it to work very well and it not be overly complicated. And then, you know, you could hide features even and build stuff out of it, which I think you have done very nicely. Uh, just kind of looking back through the history and like all the different tools, the analytic tools and, and things that you're building out of that. Um, I want to take a minute and just spend some more time like on your past because I'm, I'm super curious. Like I see you work for Stripe. Is that kind of on front end stuff, back end stuff? Like what what allows you to do so well on button down that you're working on each day? All across the board and to kind of give like the, the sort of spark notes version of, of where I've spent my time since since graduating college, like I worked at Amazon, really, really big company. And I worked at um, a Series A, Series B size technical startup after Amazon. So kind of did really, really big company, really, really small company, and now Stripe, which is somewhere in between like a very established sure. player. Um, and I, I actually started, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is very true. Um, and I started button down um, while I was still at Amazon with the sort of notion that I wanted to make sure that I had like, uh, my my full stack and my product engineering skills really, really sharp. Um, that was one of the things that I realized was uh, a reason I love programming was being able to kind of, uh, you know, it sounds cheesy and corny, but I think it's true. Like you can create whatever you put your mind to. Um, you can create a new project. And even if it's janky, even if it's rough around the edges, like you kind of built it from scratch. And there's, I think, a certain amount of pride and magic in that. And one of the things that you don't necessarily always get working for a bigger company is that that level of breadth and ownership. And I really want to recapture that, which is why I've always loved working on side projects. Um, and even now during my day job, uh, I definitely do get that level of ownership. One of the things I love about working for Stripe is you're encouraged to really go the extra mile and feel like you own the products and technical uh, implementations and everything that you're working on, which I love. But one of the things that I don't think uh, anyone should ever eschew is the opportunity to get to grow with something they built over the course of like years and years and years. You you get a level of pride and craftsmanship that I think it's really hard to capture otherwise. Yeah, I think it, like people don't people that don't have side projects like I have my this thing is my side project. Like there's so <laughs> many learnings that you get from it from an entrepreneurial standpoint from, you know, all the different code bases that you're in that maybe your job isn't directly in and you can pull so much from that and go back into like what you're working on day in day out. So I think it, it very much lends to a lot of those different skill sets that you kind of continue to build up. And so I love companies that Kind of allow you a lot of that freedom too to like go out and do those things and then you can always bring them back um kind of to what you're working on exactly um, so something else that we touched in on on your uh, bio that i'd love to i'd love to bring up here give me one sec so tell me tell me more about unloop like this as a person who loves to like teach others and build up others. Uh, this is very inspiring to me. Can you tell me a little bit about what you work on with Unloop? Yeah, absolutely. So Unloop um, is a nonprofit that works with uh, folks who have been impacted by the criminal justice or prison system. Um, one of their core theses is that, and as, as you sort of see, the uh, there's a really, really big recidivism problem, especially within Washington state, which is that one out of three folks who leave the prison system uh, are going to end up with a job 12 months after they've been released, which means two thirds folks are still going to be searching for employment. 
Um, on Loop's thesis is really similar to a lot of the the coding boot camps that you see that are like growing in popularity lately. Things like Lambda School and um, Ingot and stuff like that, which is we have a unprecedented demand for software engineers and software developers. Yep. And we have a huge corpus of folks who want to learn, who want to have a better opportunity. And one of the biggest correlations between uh, folks not re-entering the prison system is the fact that they have secure employment, they have a job, they have a future. Um, and so where I come into the picture is I work as a mentor, a code reviewer, a pair programmer with folks who are going through the unloop process. It means that uh, I'm basically sort of a, a glorified TA in a lot of ways. <laughs> so I'm working with folks who are learning new languages, who are starting new projects for the first time, who might need some help sort of like navigating AWS, who need to sort of understand how they should think about TDD, test-driven development. It's uh, a really, really great opportunity to sort of give back in what feels like a meaningful way of like, I, one of the things that I believe really, really strongly is like the tech industry is a incredible tool for social change and social movement. Um, but we have to like, I think, be careful and be smart about how we apply that. And this always struck me with the first time I read about Unloop and their mission of like, oh, this just makes sense. This is like a brilliant way to use the positive outcomes that tech and the tech industry can can enact for a greater cause, a greater good, a actual positive impact for the overall state, for the city. And as context, I live in Seattle within Washington State, which is where Unloop is based. That's a really incredible story. Um, something I noticed on that front page, and also before I forget, like 12 months is a long time to go without a full job or even like, I assume scratching together part-time jobs or whatever. But um, one thing that really struck me on that front page was it seemed to be some very young kids. So is it also not just the people that have gone into the prison system, but their families that were impacted as well? Is it kind of getting the rest of the family or the, the kids on the right track to be successful too? That's exactly right. And yeah, both in terms of folks who have been impacted, who literally were imprisoned and are now coming out, and also the, the relevant families as well. And I think one of the things that um, you see in Unloop that I think is is really nice and sort of refreshing uh, compared to the industry as a whole is like there are a wide swath of ages and demographics of folks of like I've worked with uh, folks who are, you know, on like around my age or even younger, sort of like early 20s, I've worked with folks who are coming back to programming um, at, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old who are just mm -hmm. identifying it as, oh, I'm not like a uh, a relatively young person who's trying to enter this for the first time. Mm -hmm. I'm like just trying to find a, a new career, a new path for myself. And seeing, I think, the, the really wide array of folks and backgrounds has been super rewarding. Wow, that, that's an incredible story. Uh, I'm I'm going to have to reach back out to your, or we're going to have to discuss offline, like how to get that story back out. I just, I knew it was in your bio and I wanted to touch on it real quick, but we're going to have to talk a lot more about that. Awesome. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'm going to switch back gears here a little bit. That, that was incredible. Um, but back to uh, button down and I kind of need to know more about like what is behind the scenes of button down, right? So when I get when I get an email from one of these newsletters, it's not as simple as someone went into Gmail and, and typed <laughs> up an email and sent it to to just me. Even though, you know, it could feel that way, like it's very personalized and uh, usually is because I've signed up for that newsletter, it's kind of the subject I want to be on. But um can can you break down like why are you using Heroku? Like what's hosted there? Like, is there email services? Like, can you just talk about the tech behind the button down a little bit? Totally. Um, and feel free and ask me to drill in. I'll kind of give the like 500 yard view of everything and then talk a bit more about specifics. Um, so button down is ultimately built on top of Django, which is a web framework uh, built around Python. I, I chose Django just because it's something that I was familiar with. I've been using it for what feels like a dozen years at this point. Um, and I wanted to kind of hit the ground running. One of my philosophies with, with starting new side projects is change exactly one thing, like go outside your comfort zone for one part of your stack. That way you can evaluate it in, it in isolation and then have a bunch of other things that you're really comfortable with. Uh, so you're not like totally in the deep end with all of the new parts of the stack. It's just one thing that you're kind of evaluating and learning. 
Um, so I use Django for the, the core backend and I use yeah. Vue, which is a front end framework kind of similar to React or Angular or Svelte um, for the front end. It's a it's based around this concept of like single file components, which is, okay, you're going to have your HTML, the JavaScript that powers your HTML and the CSS to style your HTML all in one convenient package. So everything's pretty, pretty localized. And then you can tie that together with a lot of the sort of functional frameworks that React has made uh, more common and more popular, like state management, routing, and those sorts of things. So and then, J oh, Django, go ahead. I'm, sorry, Django, I'm not that familiar with. Is that comparative to like maybe a PHP on the back end? Um, or like, is that a microservice? Like what's, what's Django look like? I would like, I think the, the shortest definition is Rails, except in Python, okay. because it really is similar. It focuses on the MVC or model view controller framework. It's pretty opinionated in terms of what you can do with it and what you can't. Um, and it also has a really, really robust third party packaging and plugin ecosystem. So like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel a lot with it, which I really respect. I don't have to be like, oh, I need to develop two factor off from scratch just to get two-factor off working. There's going to be a third-party plugin for that. I don't need to reinvent like gravestoning records for that. There's already a plugin for that. It has a really vibrant and helpful community, just like Jing, uh, just like Python altogether, which I find sure. super valuable. So that's that's the actual like server. Is is Vue actually hosted on its own statically, or you're actually serving up Vue files through that somehow? Uh, the former. It's views being hosted statically on a combination of S3 and AWS CloudFront. Cool. Yeah, that's really neat architecture. Sorry, I completely interrupted you. So if you want to keep going through the, the breakdown there. No, no worries. Um, so Django and Vue is sort of the core backend and front end stack. Um, it's all being hosted and vended by uh, Heroku, which is a platform as a service that's been around for a while. I know there are kind of like uh, new hotnesses, so to speak, in terms of uh, things that are trying to do Heroku, except in a more modern approach. Um, Render, I think, is a very common, very recent popular version of that. But Heroku is one of the things that I have used a handful of times. I know its edges and its benefits and drawbacks. And I just like have a level of muscle memory with it, so sure. to speak, that yeah. it, it always seemed useful to, to jump on. Um, there are parts of Heroku that I don't use. And I instead go, quote unquote, uh, close to the metal with AWS in. For example, yeah. all of my databases I don't use Heroku for, I use AWS. And okay. that's mostly a cost benefit analysis of, sure, I'm going to have to put a bit more effort into getting it set up and running originally. Um, but AWS is just going to be cheaper than Heroku yeah. or a similar managed solution. Yeah, very cool. So when when you talk about like databases for, for those items, if you don't mind me asking, is it mainly like Dynamo that you're using at that point for all of that? Or is there something deeper that you have to use for like SQL based queries? And for, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit old school. I swear by Postgres and pretty much okay. everything I can do. Um, I So I use RDS, I use relational databases. And again, that's a level of familiarity that I just feel good with. Postgres is really powerful, and I know how to do most of the things I want to do with it. Dynamo is great for really, really write intensive or really, really horizontally scalable solutions. Um, but for button down, I was like, I think this data model is pretty relational. Like I have newsletters, I have emails, I have subscribers. Like I understand how all those things map together in a relational sense really, really well. And I just kind of jumped on that. Very cool. Um, so Let's talk a minute since I'm going to have to do this shortly. Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's pretend Coding Cat's about to sign up for uh, Button Down. So the the first kind of thing to go through there um, when you when you set up like your your Button Down service, if you will, um, I, I start to create Coding Cat's newsletter. Um, there's kind of this piece in there that starts to say like, are you hosting or are you using your own domain? Are you not using it? Can you talk a little bit about like some pros and cons there for using mostly like button down as it is, um, versus using your own custom domain and, and those sort of, uh, changes that you might make? For sure. One of the things that I felt kind of passionately about uh, when building Button Down was the idea that it should be a white label service of like you are ultimately sending email newsletters. Like you were saying uh, earlier, the the joy of newsletters is it's when you receive one, it kind of sounds like someone's just writing to you in Gmail, right? It's not right. like coming from some sort of like grand third party service. It feels very personal. It feels very like peer to peer, and I, I wanted to like honor that as much as I could with button down. And so some of the functionality I built out was around like making sure you could send from your own domain, making sure you could host all of your stuff on your own domain. The idea being, if you wanted to, 
uh, your button down newsletter ha doesn't have the word button down on it anywhere. It is just a newsletter that you are using a white glove service for. Um, and so we actually have a pretty even split of folks who are kind of bringing their own custom domain and hosting their stuff and sending from their own IP or domain versus folks who are using button down's explicit domain. Um, and it's been one of the interesting things to watch as Bundown has grown, which is a lot of the early users were very technical, had similar use cases as me. They would always be sending from their own domains. They would be sending from their own IPs because they just wanted the like customization and the fiddliness uh, that Bundown offered. And now as it's grown and hit a bit more of like a mass market stage, more and more folks are just saying, oh, but I don't want to deal with DNS records. That's kind of a pain. <laughs> like, just handle all of this for me. I don't care if it says, like, at mg.buttondown.email at the end of it. That's completely fine. I just don't want to have to worry about that. And one of the interesting things has been how to strike that balance between, like, really, really nice, sensible defaults versus allowing escape hatches for advanced and technical users. Yeah, and so some of those things, there's there's a little bit of pro and con to, and I'm going to bring something up, and I hope this makes sense to bring up, and you can tell me I'm crazy otherwise. Uh, if you can't tell everyone, uh, I'm totally new to this whole like newsletter, and, and email is not my bag, so Justin will probably uh, be like, why are you asking me this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have this, and this is, uh, I subscribe to Cassidy Williams' newsletter, and I just brought up kind of, when you go into Gmail, there's this little drop down, right? And it shows all of these like cool things. So uh, it's, it basically says here, Cassie has her newsletter coming from, uh, and it's from Cassidy at Cassidy, Cassidy.co. I can never say that right. But, <laughs> um, and then you reply back to Cassidy. But the fun part is if we kind of creep down through here, the mailing list is actually Cassidy at button or dot button down dot email and then mailed by cassidude.email. So there's a few things in here and I was I was hoping that you could break down for those of us who are terrible about like what actually occurs in email. Um, what do all these different things mean and how much control do you have when emailing people? Totally. And there is nothing I think I love more than nerding out about various email and SMTP uh, eccentricities and details. So this is my, my favorite part. Awesome. Um, and I also think this is like a good showcase of customizability, not just with button down, but with emails in general and why email is such an interesting platform. Um, you basically have three elements here. You've got the sending email, which is that actual from email. That is Cassidy, or sorry, Cassidy at Cassidy.co. That is where the email is explicitly coming from. Um, you have the sending domain. That's the Cassidy.email. You see that at the top with the from, and then you also see the mailed by and the signed by. That is the what we refer to pretty often as the sending domain. It's explicitly where the MX record is being signed and being verified to make sure that it's not a spammy email, it's not a spoof, it's not someone trying to steal your password or anything along those lines. And it also really, really helps deliverability. If you have a sending domain that matches on all of these fields, it means that your email is gonna land in more folks' inboxes and it's not gonna be in the promotions tab or anything like that, yeah. it's going to be in the actual inbox. That was that um, was one of the big questions. Is how do we get it out of Gmail's other tabs and in the inbox? <laughs> totally. And uh, a sidebar on that is because I always find it interesting. Is like it is sort of a cat and mouse game, and yeah. it's one of the things that I think uh, Gmail does explicitly like really well for a black box implementation of like from their perspective, they don't want you to have ultimate control of what tab it's going to land in, right? Because right. if everyone <laughs> was given the opportunity, they would all say, oh, this needs to be in the main tab because it is important. It's going to get read more that way. Um, and I talked to a lot of folks who are like, how do I get this out of marketing? How do I get this out of <laughs> newsletters? And the, the shortest answer is not even based on the headers. It's based on the content of the email itself. Mm -hmm. And it's about what, what does your email contain? If it is like Cassidy's email, where it is mostly prose, it has a bunch of links, it's not heavily styled, there aren't a lot of images, that's something that's going to generally land more in primary newsletter inboxes, as opposed to something that is like, uh, you know, your traditional e-commerce email. You can imagine like five different background colors and a bunch of hero shots of different products and links out, yeah. not much <laughs> actual text. And that's the thing that gets caught in marketing, gets caught in spam filter, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Uh, sorry, that was, that was always a, a fun digression because I, I like to talk a lot about sort of the Gmail filtering rules and how no, they I, I think that's fantastic because I've, I feel like other marketers, if you will, are doing something wrong because they constantly end up in there. And it's like, why wouldn't you like tweak some things to get out of that? Like, yeah, I get it. Like a lot of people might not use tabs, so they're going direct to the inbox. But essentially, there's a lot of tools out there that you can send a email to like a test email, like test blah, blah, blah at gmail.com. And it will fire through all those tests. And just sending it to that and noticing like this isn't even going to come close to your inbox. Like, <laughs> is, is that something like you even think about and button down to add like a tool like that to say you're going to like 95% chance end up in inbox. Is that something that's on your list of the roadmap or whatever? Totally. And even explicitly the email service provider that I use pretty heavily called Mailgun has that exact API that you're talking about, which is this is a simple REST API, send us a, a subject and some bodies, and we will figure out just on average with our test inboxes where it lands up in. Um, and I've kind of had this like nagging to do for gosh, I don't know, maybe two years or so ever since they sort of launched that of like, okay, I feel like I should build this out into button down at some point. This seems like it'd be really useful. I know people would use it. Um, and one of the things that I've like really struggled with and also grown with as button down has increased in size and has matured a little bit is figuring out how to limit the surface area and the scope of what button down can do. Sure. Like one of the things that I took for granted when I was first building out and launching button down is like the MVP, the, the V1.0 was how easy it is to, to cobble on more and more features over time yeah. of like, Oh well, I know I want to handle tagging, so I'll I'll add tagging and I'll make a nice tagging interface. Oh, I want to have this setting for overriding the specific transactional email, so I'll, I'll add a page to do that. And over time, you get this level of like uh, technical and product detritus of <laughs> you your product can collapse under the weight of all of the various knobs and switches. And I know, like especially, I, I think of 2018 for me as the the year of scope creep because I was just adding a bunch of stuff. It was like I had this mental calculus in my head of, oh, this person says they would sign, you know, a $99 a month deal if they could do this thing with Bundown. Of course, I'm going to build that out. Right, but then you do right. that 10 times and suddenly you have 10 features that are all kind of one-offs that don't really fit into an overall cohesive product, right. especially for something like Bundown, where my goal is to have it be simple and minimalistic. Um, and then you, you look at how much time you spent for all those one-offs. Was it really worth the 99 bucks a month? Right? <laughs> exactly. Especially right. when you realize, oh, I've had to do so many bug fixes and yep. like database migrations and little paper cut cleanups for that one thing. It spirals out of control pretty quickly. Um, and so whenever I like think of a new roadmap item that I really want to take on, because I do have a laundry list of things to always like consider. You sort of hear of it as the, the freezer, the icebox in, in yeah. agile senses. Uh, my question is sort of like, would the majority of button down users find this useful? And then secondarily and selfishly, would I find this useful? Yeah. Um, because after a certain point, I do have to, I think, curtail the solution space of what button down can do. I've, I've offboarded a lot of customers who are just like, man, I really want email automation. I really want A-B testing. Like, I completely understand that's a completely valid request, but I'm probably just never going to build that. Like, it's it's too complex. I feel like it would be betraying what the core value prop is of the product and um, making the product better for 1% of customers is not necessarily worth making it worse for the other 99%. Yeah. And the, the nice thing there, you do allow like the full API access too. So if they wanted to like add their own automation to that piece of it, they really could It'd just be outside of button down, right? Exactly. I, I think of the API and things like Zapier as like the escape yeah. hatch for, for me being like very peculiar and particular with the interface of like, if you really want to just use button down as infrastructure and like right. build up your own rails and everything else, you can do that. I make that possible. You're just going to have to exist outside of the UI to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we went down a little bit of a path there. I, I'll bring it <laughs> back up. I, I thought it was a good path, so we should stand on it. Um, so we kind of, we covered like the from and then the reply to, I feel like you can put anything in there essentially, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then basically I'm really curious about like this mailing list. Is that something that is coming from Mailgun or how does that get associated? 
Great question. Uh, mailing lists are sort of an esoteric email feature, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a unique identifier that you can give to an email, like a, a periodic email that's going out mm. to multiple people. And by itself, it doesn't do anything. Okay. Um, the way it gets some level of like power and gravitas is from things like Gmail that will build out functionality around it. Like you can see on this, um, there's a filter messages from this mailing list button. I know me personally, like for all of my periodic, say like weekly and monthly newsletters, I filter them to a specific tab and I kind of read through them as if it's like an RSS reader. Yeah. And this makes it really, really powerful and functional. You can override the idea if you want to. It doesn't have to be uh, your username.bundown.email. You can set it to whatever you want. It just needs to be something that is uh, globally unique. It's kind of namespaced in a way. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay, cool. So yeah, I was kind of curious why like this switch to button.down.email versus everything else having the, the Cassidy.email. So that's interesting. Totally. And then, um, so, so Cassidy actually has this set up um, on her own domain like this, I, I believe, unless I'm totally crazy here. Um, typically, if if someone just came in, didn't set up their own own domain or anything, these would also be mailed by and signed by button down dot email, correct? Yep, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm missing a lot of probably questions. Is there anything that sticks out that I haven't asked about like this section of email yet? No, I think you've covered yeah. all the bases. I think the <laughs> the one that has a lot of complexity that button down thankfully hides is sort of that that last one, the security and the signed by. Um, dealing with uh, SPF and DKIM, which are two sort of encryption and uh, spam prevention protocols. Uh, that's one of the things that like I really want to... I really hope no one has to deal with it to the scale and level that I've dealt with it. It's something that should just work, right? Of you own this domain, you send some records and you're good to go. And being able to abstract out that rat's nest of um, weird verifications and shenanigans is one of my main goals with Button Down. Yeah, very cool. Um, so there's, there's probably two major things that I still want to talk about. One of them that kind of became a little bit of a hot button and maybe it's just because of the world we live in with GDPR and all that fun stuff, um, you recently made a decision to turn off like analytics by default. Um, can you talk a little bit how the heck analytics work? Um, I've experienced it from using Mailgun myself, but how that works for like a, a end user that isn't technical at all that's getting those analytics back? How does like Pixel work and all that fun stuff? For sure. Um, so when People talk about email analytics. They're talking usually about two different subsets, uh, open tracking and link tracking or click tracking. Open tracking is sort of that classic tracking pixel situation, which is at the bottom of every email, you have a one pixel by one pixel transparent image that pings back to an email service provider. And that email service provider knows that if that request has been pinged or pung, um, then someone has opened that email. And that quote unquote, someone who opened it might not be the actual person reading the email, right? It might be a firewall, it might be a spam scanner, might be some Gmail's automation, could be anything, but that's that general mechanism. And then the click tracking mechanism works sort of similar. Uh, ESPs like Mailgun or Postmark or Amazon's simple email service do what's called link rewriting. It says, okay, if you're gonna send a link to google.com, we're going to transform that link into, uh, to take Mailgun as an example, mailgun.com slash tracking slash google.com. That way you're routing through our services and we can see if that link is being clicked, we can mark a database entry, send out a webhook event and we'll know. And you still end up at the same place, but we kind of sit in the middle so we can get some analytics. So those, those are the two main types of analytics. And when I introduced analytics for button down, I kind of had this uh, laissez-faire attitude of like, sure, people want link tracking. It's really not that much more effort for me to have it be on by default versus off by default. It was just like a database flag, right? right. Um, I will have it be on because more functionality and more functionality equals good. Um, one of the things I've realized is kind of twofold. One is that most people aren't actually super concerned about how their tracking is doing. They want to make sure that emails are ending up in inboxes okay and they're not going to spam. But but a lot of the opens and clicks, 
they can be really useful, but sometimes they're just vanity metrics of like, yeah. oh, I kind of want to make sure a lot of people are opening this, but I'm not actually changing any of my behavior. Sure. Um, and the other thing is like, a lot of those metrics can be inaccurate because again, there's sort of a cat, of, cat and mouse game between email service providers and uh, inboxes like Gmail or like Apple's mail where privacy is becoming more and more of a really personal consumer issue. And I know like, I don't always feel great about knowing that every email I open, even if it's from a newsletter or if it's from like a friend or colleague, it's getting trapped somewhere. Like you can imagine kind of the event stream of, oh, I've opened this five times and clicked on these specific links. Like I completely respect both authors and subscribers who just don't want to be a part of that. Um, and I think one of the things that has been really nice about working about Bun Down for so long is you get the opportunity to revisit a lot of the decisions that you made, you know, two years ago, three years ago, yeah. four years ago. And one day I just kind of came back to this. I, I think uh, a customer or someone flagged it as a like, hey, you talk a lot about privacy. Maybe you should have it be uh, opting out of analytics by default. And I kind of did that mental exercise of if I were to do this from scratch, like would I have it be on by default or off by default? And I realized that my position had changed. And now I just felt like, oh, it should be off by default. And making that change is like really, really small. It's, I think, literally four lines of code to both default to off and make sure folks were still on the current level of analytics tracking that they signed up with. Because you don't want any sort of like negative impact where someone right. who was getting analytics suddenly stopped or vice versa. Um, and it, it just, I think, clarified a lot of Bundown's purpose, which was, you can do tracking if you want to. We'll have robust analytics and you can visualize your newsletter over time. But that's not really what Bundown is about at its core. It's just about sending and managing that newsletter as easily as possible. It's not necessarily about getting the most analytically friendly solution. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, on as far as like the privacy concerns and things like that, uh, I know button down is GDPR uh, compliant as well. Does that mean that at, at any given point, someone calls me up and says, nope, I need my name out of everything. Do I just click in a uh, button down and say, please, you know, delete and it just purges everything and we're good to go? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So that pulls out like the analytics side too, I assume. Mm -hmm. And one of the advantages, too, of not going too heavy on analytics yeah. is there are a lot of these third party services where it's, oh, I can get the IP address and like the first right. name and last name associated with this email address, but I have to do data sharing, which means I'm passing on my subscriber data to this third party provider. They might sell it, they might repackage it, they might be doing something malicious with it. Button down, you just don't have to worry about that with because all your data is staying completely within button down's kind of like walled garden, so to speak. Sure. Um, which I, I probably should have talked about this kind of in the beginning and as I walked through all the different steps. So we talked about like if Code and Cat were to, to get going, we'd set it up and, and kind of the domains and things like that. And now we're kind of talking about more of the sending, but there's a step in there. I guess maybe it's in order because now we want subscribers, right? So mm -hmm. uh, now I like... I, I go out and I would normally like, hey, everyone that's, you know, using Coding Cat, please go sign up or whatever. You have some really nice tools that um, like I can basically put a form on there, which is on Coding Cat now that you can you can basically type in your email and click uh, submit. But it's actually redirecting over to button down to take care of the rest. And that's that's ultimately like one of the biggest reasons I wanted to go. Uh, with a external like software as a service like button down is to take care of the the spam essentially <laughs> of signups and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about like the process that you have to go through to try to verify a person is who they say they are or at least uh, an actual person and not just a bot <laughs> trying to bang away at newsletters? Oh man, this is, I talked earlier about cat and mouse games and this yeah. is really the true one, which is, uh, the the quest to make sure an email address is valid is never solved. Yeah. Um, I have, I think, I, I have an entire internal framework just around email address validation. And I think I'm at like 14 steps now. Um, and it, it really, uh, it varies wildly of you can do IP address validation. You can do specific email address validation, like throwing it against a very, very weird and janky regular expression. You can do some sort of like second party validations. And an example of that is uh, a lot of people don't know this, but 
every Gmail address actually has to conform to a very, very specific specific regex that Gmail exposes in a like quasi hidden API. And the vast majority of email addresses on the internet these days are coming from Gmail or a Gmail subsidiary. So yeah. hitting Gmail to make sure like, hey, Google, does this email address seem right to you? Um, I use a number of third party services that are completely from a um, allow list standpoint, which is they are just reporting other folks that have reported a given email address has been marked as spammy or is otherwise uh, exhibiting bot-like behavior. Sure. Um, I cross-reference subscribers with other events. So if you try and sign up at uh, alex at gmail.com, and I already see that I've had four other alex at gmail.com sign up to a different button down newsletter, and maybe they didn't interact with the newsletter, or maybe they uh, bounced or things like that. Um, I will flag that. But all of those things kind of pale in comparison to the the closest we can get to the holy grail of email address val validation, which is double opt-in of yeah. you sign up and I will send you an email saying, hey, it looks like you signed up. Can you click this to make sure you're an actual human? And obviously that's an additional step. A lot of folks don't like the fact that like, oh, there's a part of the funnel that we're injecting and not as many people are gonna actually go through and click that. But that is sort of the ultimate answer to make sure like, hey, all of these subscribers that I'm seeing in my list are completely valid. I know this because they took the trouble of going into their email and clicking a link to make sure that they're human, that they opted into this behavior. Yeah, I kind of feel like there's there's a portion and not to like try to stay free forever on your platform because I want to pay developers. They spend a lot of time on this, but a thousand emails, like if you're just someone spamming the heck out of you or getting signups that don't have that double opt in, all of a sudden your your tools becoming or like the this, this service user is kind of getting frustrated because they're like, we're not getting our return on value through this, but realistically, like you're just sending junk to no one. So with that double opt-in, it's it's kind of nice to guarantee like I am actually like getting these people in that are interested and also like I'm staying within the thousand limit for the free part. And then once it explodes past that, like that's a whole different um, story, right? So it, it it is, it's a big struggle, I think, to get through that. But I would not want to do any of this on my own. So when when we had like our WordPress site up or even like our current site, we have so many like Russian emails that come through with like every letter dot is, is like the character <laughs> yeah, in it. It's just like, oh, this is so frustrating. You know, it's total garbage, but it's like, how are you going to deal with that? And so the, the fact that you're, you're taking so many steps for us to like deal with that already is fantastic. So that was one of the biggest reasons that I started looking at button down after I saw Cassidy's new letter, newsletter coming out uh, using it. So um, really appreciate all those steps that you've put in there. I feel like I'm, I'm probably missing a, a thousand things. Is there is there anything else that you can think of that I'm just blatantly completely missing from button down or you want to tell the users about? I think the, the biggest question that I still get um, from folks who like button down kind of abstractly is they like, oh, I want to start a side project too. I want to grow something. Like, where do I get started and what should I know ahead of time? Um, and I think the the answer to the first one is just get started with something that you want to see in the world. Like it's a cliche, but it's true. Like okay. you need to have a good amount of intrinsic motivation to really carry something across the finish line. And then once you do, and once you get to that stage of iteration and slow growth, it's really, really rewarding. And it's really hard to do that if you don't put in the effort to build something that you really enjoy and that you want to use yourself, even if you were the only user there. Right. Um, so th that's one thing. And the other thing is like um, button down was not large. It was not used by more than, you know, a couple dozen people for the entire first year of its life. Um, it existed as a thing that like I posted about on Twitter and then I used a handful of times and was constantly using, but it wasn't really growing a lot for its first year. Um, and I think a lot of folks who I talk to who are looking to start new projects kind of get maybe dismayed. Like there's this idea that you sort of, you launch and you go viral and it's just a rocket ship from there. And like yeah. suddenly you have a very successful side project. 
And the, the projects I admire don't actually follow that pattern. They follow the pattern of someone slowly hammering away at an interesting and difficult problem for a long period of time and success slowly and organically finding them. It's, you're never going to have that metaphorical windfall uh, on day one or day two. It's more a slow process of growth and improvement. Yeah, great advice. That's fantastic. Um, do you, have you seen anyone that uses button down that because of their newsletter, they've really like blown up? I've seen a handful of folks. Um, and it's, it's really exciting to see. It was also one of the funnier things to see, which is I have a lot of, uh, as we were talking about earlier, like anti-fraud, anti-spam detection. Um, and the, the first few times I saw newsletter authors go really, really viral where they hit the front page of Hacker News and read it, yeah. it actually triggered some alarms and some pages on my end of like, oh, this person is getting thousands of subscriber subscribers in the course of like a couple hours. There must be something fishy going on here. And I like reached out to the person. I was like, hey, I'm seeing a lot. And he's like, yeah, ch check out Hacker News. And I was like, oh, congrats. This is really, really cool. And seeing someone go from like, literally starting from nothing, importing like an initial corpus of three or four subscribers to having tens of thousands of subscribers entirely on button down is really, really cool. It makes me I, super happy. I, I think you just, I mean, you just gave me the chills, like just thinking about that. That's incredible. The product you made, you're now making all these other people successful by using it. That's, that's an awesome, awesome story. Congrats, Justin. That's, that's amazing. Thanks so much. Um, so I think it's a good time to break into a fun part of the, the pod. We like to call perfect picks. And Justin, you have been kind enough to provide your picks for me. And so I'll bring up your first one. So I just finished up this weekend uh, a video game called Celeste. Celeste is a platforming video game. If you've ever played you know, Super Mario Brothers, one of the old ones that's entirely 2D, uh, it's kind of similar to that. The concept is you play as this character, Madeline, who is trying to climb a mountain uh, purely because she wants to climb a mountain. She's kind of <laughs> in a rut in her life, and she needs to do something big and impactful to like sort of shake things up. I, I loved this this game. Like I loved every part of it. The music was amazing. The plot was like very, very sweet. The graphics are gorgeous. It's sort of in this retro pixel art style that I, I really, really love. But the core of the gameplay, I just found so enriching because it's frustrating. You die a lot. Like you're gonna have a lot of parts where you like fall over the edge or you jump into spikes. Um, but one of the things that Celeste really, really focuses on is like, that's completely fine. Dying a lot is actually a badge of honor as long as you finally get past the stage and you get past the pitfall. It focuses on quick iteration loops, which I found like very resonant to my programming life as well of like, you're gonna die 50 times just to get past this one area, but you're gonna do so in the span of like seven or eight minutes. So it's really not painful. You're not waiting through game over screens and you're not like waiting for the game to reload or anything like that. You die and then a second later, you're back there to try again. You get a real sense of like, seeing your skills improve in a game that I haven't felt in a while of like, I could just tell after going back to the first few stages, having completed the game, just how much better I was, which was like a really cool experience of like, I generally don't think of video games as something that uh, are, you know, methods of self-improvement. Usually for me, it's more a method of escapism of like, yeah. I want to turn yeah. my brain off at the end of the day. But Celeste inverted that for me. It was like, I'm trying to focus to be better at this game. And it really, I think, tied in with the the game's messaging and the game's story in a way that was super rewarding. Wow, that's really incredible. Uh, I'm gonna have to show this to my son. He's he's about to turn twelve, so hopefully it'll uh, work out for him. Nice. Your second pick. Then my second pick is a book that I am finishing up actually today. Um, the Death and Life of Great American Cities. This is a, a bit of an oldie. It's by Jane Jacobs. It was published in the uh, 70s with a couple sort of um, updated versions ever since. I'm listening to one that I think came out in the, the 90s. Um, and it's, it is ostensibly about exactly what the title suggests. It's about how to build and maintain really, really good cities. Um, but I think a lot of the messages of the book transcend the idea of just cities or just like urban design and are actually about how do you build any sort of work uh, past a certain scale. A lot of the messages that Jane Jacobs talks about are things about like making sure that you're thinking with both a local and a global lens and how to think about injections of resources and injections of capital, how to think about changing things abruptly versus changing things slowly. And 
I'm like, I'm a bit of a public planning nerd myself. So a lot of the, the text of the book is rich on its own, but the subtext of the book and the messages it tries to impart to the reader about how to learn and how to impact change in the greater world without disrupting things and breaking things irreparably, I think is really, really powerful. Wow, that sounds incredible. I'll have to give that one a read. Easy to get through? There are some sluggish parts. There's a lot about like just automobile traffic patterns in New York in the 70s, but that is what uh, fast forward is for or slipping through that specific chapter. Um, and beyond that, I think it's just interesting to hear about how a lot of the like problems that I think are very modern of, like I said, I, I live in Seattle and we're dealing with as a city, things like urban sprawl and things like yeah. uh, housing price rises and all of these things, like none of them are new. We've been dealing with them for, for literally a century and getting right. reminded of that and getting to see a, a very fresh lens, even if that fresh lens is coming from 50 years ago, I think is really, really useful. Yeah. I think with all the stuff like Tesla and Uber or Lyft more so is probably talked about like trying to get into cities and like by taking the the actual like amount of cars out, what we can do with uh you know rebuilding city, cities and revitalizing them. It's it's really gone a long way. So I'd, I'd be curious to pick this up and check it out. Awesome. Um, okay, so my first pick, and I didn't know which way to kind of list this out. So we talked about Cassidy Williams uh, newsletter that I subscribe to. So I thought it would only be right for me to pick this and put it in the uh, the blog that we put out. So the interesting part is, um, so this is the button down version of it. And then there is also, Cassidy has her own. And the reason I wanted to kind of show both is this is actually, I don't know if this is I framed in, I, I think it must be. Um, but this is also the same subscribe hosted on Casty's platform, iframing in that same subscribe button. So I just wanted to show the difference there. And of course, her newsletter is amazing and hilarious. So uh, if you do anything in tech, which I hope if you're listening to this podcast, you do um, check that out and subscribe to it. It's very cool. Uh, I also always try to do like a, a non-technical pick and I'm about to run a marathon and these have been fantastic. So I've, I've always used goo and stuff like that for marathons. And this is like more of a water soluble. And so it's a sport energy gel that you can take and you don't have to like chug a whole thing of water with it as you're going. So, um, I highly recommend these. I've been using them for training now and, uh, I'm looking forward to using them in the half. They don't make my stomach like turn upside down and feel horrible the rest of the day. So another another fun pick there. I do a lot of long distance biking and the I think the biking equivalent is not uh, the goo, but the cubes. Yep. Um, where it's just like you pop them in your mouth like Starburst essentially. Um, it's always like, all right, well, this is strange. I feel like I'm, I'm living a little bit in a dystopian future, but it works really well. Yeah. Um, and certainly is more palatable than like chugging. Yeah, my buddy um, does a lot of gravel bike um, races, um, like across Michigan. He's done one and stuff like that. And he's he's always telling me, "Oh, do this, do that." I'm like, I can't carry all this stuff. Like, what are you? You have a bike to hook it to. Like, I can't carry this around. And he's always like, "No, it'd be fantastic. Put it in a backpack or something." I'm like, "What? I can't run four hours with a backpack on." I'm sorry. So he's he's always giving me tips that I always have to kind of shrug off. <laughs> um, awesome. So basically I, I thought this whole thing's amazing. I can't wait to get started on button down myself for coding cat and get our newsletter up and running finally and get, get all those juicy, uh, technical tidbits. So uh, again, thanks so much for creating the platform. I, I hope it's, uh, even more successful in the future than it already is, even though it is fantastic already. Um, and I also want to, uh, just say again, thanks for, uh, putting the unloop piece in there. We're going to have to reconnect and talk more about that. That's a huge passion of mine. So thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Alex. Cool, Justin. Take care. Take it easy.